Welcome back to Restored Gospel Podcasts with Matt from Mormon Rescue. Matt put out a video this week called Mormon Bondage, and we play it from time to time to kind of dive into some of these ideas. Uh, so I just want to ask Matt, where did you come up with this? Uh, where'd you come up with this idea? To do the video? Yeah. So it was actually from this uh, group of friends of mine. Um, and a lady named Trisha, she shared the image of this um, fireside. And when she shared it on our group chat, I was like, what in the world? And so I had to go and find the video and watch it. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, this can't be real. This has got to be a meme. And then it was real. I couldn't believe it. So, yeah. Well, let's first, let me ask you about the word bondage. What is, uh, I always say words are clumsy. They take on different meanings and different cultures, different time periods. What does bondage mean to you? Man, it means What's taking away your freedom. Takes away, taking away your freedom. Right. So is that kind of what it means to you? It's the same as captivity, right? Yeah. <clears throat> well, when I hear the word bondage, I, yeah. I think of, well, I have images of, I guess, someone being tied up. Yeah. I also, because I've read the word some, um, that I think of being spiritually held in maybe darkness or with the veil over my eyes or just not being able to see light and truth from a spirit yeah. standpoint. Um, yeah. okay. But what uh, summarize the video you watched before we get into your video that kind of comment has some commentary on that, but what was your overall feeling from this video that you watched and what from Renland? the, the one that you read that your friend shared with you that, yeah. yeah. Well, it was just the BYU speeches video. Mm -hmm. And so it showed the speech and, uh, my initial feeling was just creepy, like a sinking feeling in my stomach. Mm -hmm. Just like, I can't believe they're doing this. And, um, yeah, I really thought it was a meme and then I couldn't believe it was real because it just goes against everything in the Book of Mormon. I mean, it literally everything. It just goes straight against it. And um, it, it was just kind of just this sick feeling like they're going so blatant that they're not even hiding anymore. They're not even pretending anymore. They're just going straight out there in public and tying up girls. I mean, that's it kind of reminded me of that feeling I felt when I learned about Violet Kimball, who was the um, wife of Heber C. Kimball. Joseph, or Brigham Young's first counselor in the first presidency and how she would go out and try and recruit uh, young girls to be in, in Brigham or in, in her husband's harem. And I saw, I watched Renlund's wife tying this girl up with this kind of hard look on her face. And I was like, Oh man, this can't, this is terrible. It's terrible. So they were trying to to make a some time some type of helpful point, correct? Nope. There's there <laughs> there trying to be a point made doing this. Uh, yeah. Some type of spiritual uplifting, yeah, teaching teaching point, um, but it turned out to be just kind of creepy. Yeah, and I just wonder these people they literally must they either don't read the Book of Mormon, or they're doing it on purpose. Because mm -hmm. the Book of Mormon never talk, talks about this stuff. I mean, it teaches the opposite so many times. Like I shared, what, maybe five or ten scriptures? There are so many more about this. And um, how could they just go in direct opposition to everything the Book of Mormon teaches? I just, I can't comprehend it. Well, we'll have a link to your original video, and then we're going to play some parts of it here. So let's just uh, hit play and see. Uh... I was absolutely stunned this week watching the actions of one of the top leaders of the LDS Church. And no, it wasn't President Nelson buying up the Kirtland Temple, although that was what made the biggest <clears throat> splash in the news. The thing that stunned me was watching one of the Twelve Apostles have his wife publicly tie up a young woman in front of himself and his audience in order to teach about church covenants. The event was a devotional given by LDS Apostle Dale Renland last week at BYU. In his speech, Renland set the stage for the bondage role play by going through some common modern doctrine. For example, here are some of his quotes from his talk. He said, members of the church want to be co-inheritors with Jesus Christ of all that Heavenly Father has. But to do that, they have to make and keep covenants with God. And according to Renlin, there is only one way to return to God, 
And that is designated as the covenant path, which I would add is something that is never taught in the Book of Mormon. Okay. Now, it just strikes me that seeing this flow of his logic is so similar <laughs> to what um, the daughter of Akish uh, in Ether, man, what was his, what was her, uh, yeah, it was Akish, daughter of Akish. She, um, and Akish decided to, to do this with the people he called into his household. He called all his friends and his family. What did he do? He promised them to be basically co-inheritors. He promised them power and to be, um, he had to have power of the people basically and riches to become co-inheritors with me. And what do you have to do to do that? You have to make covenants. You have to swear oaths. And they weren't just oaths like the devil. It was oaths before God. This all that Akish did was in the name of God. And the people were flattered and they thought this is great. It's from God. But what they had to do, they had to swear oaths or make bonds so that what's what does it say? I can't remember the verbiage exactly, but whatever he asked them or told them to do, they would have to do. And they thought it was great. They're going to get some good stuff in the end. God approves of it all. And But the Book of Mormon teaches us that this is actually, this is the faith of, face of Satan. Trying to, to bind you down under oaths to do things that leaders tell you all in the name of God. It's, it's just so bold-faced. I mean, it's just right there. All right. And he led them away by fair promises to do whatsoever thing he desired. And he did administer unto them the oaths which were given to him by them of old, who also sought power. And the oath was, they swear unto him by the God of heaven, and also by the heavens, and also by the earth, and by their heads, that whoso should vary from the assistance which Achish desired should lose his head. And whosoever should divulge whatsoever thing Achish made known unto them, the same should lose his life. That's almost exactly what the wordage is in the temple, the LDS temple, that if you share these secrets, then you could lose your life. Um, you cut off your head, you take out your guts. Um, but the promise is, you know, you get to gain power, um, you get fair promises. And so this is all, and it says, it came to pass they formed a secret combination, even as they of old, which combination is most abominable and wicked above all in the sight of God. You think of what the commandments are. What's the worst thing you could possibly do in the world? And the Book of Mormon teaches the worst thing is to make these combinations, swearing oaths by God, um, to do things whatever your leader tells you to. I think there's. Uh, I think we'll get into a bit of this when we do our uh, video on the Kirtland Temple. Uh, some of these oaths. You you did another video on oaths, and you know in the Old Testament it says, "Let your swearing be by." Um, well, at one point it says, "Do you know? Don't swear under the God. Let your yes be yes, and your no no. But but don't make oaths or or swearing by God." And I think that's in the New Testament, wasn't it? It's Jesus, Where, right? It's right, Jesus right. in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, exactly. And you brought light to that, uh, and I had never thought much deeper than that. I'm like, well, that's kind of a weird saying. Yeah. But it was like Jesus when he dies and is resurrected. What is the like what is you have this term called covenant path in the LDS, but what else is there other than baptism and offering up a broken heart and a contrite spirit as sacrifice? You know, is how is there other oaths, covenants, things being done beyond that? Um, is that church culture? Is the Book of Mormon teach that? I don't find anything else other than that. Yeah, not in the Book of Mormon, not at all. He does away with everything, all their sacrifices, all their burnt offerings, no oaths, um, nothing. All he wants is a broken heart and contrary spirit. And then you say, well, what does that mean? And I mean, you could argue all day about that. But to me, it just means coming unto Jesus and being willing to treat your neighbors as with love, basically. Be able okay. to interact with other people in love. And here you have this. It says each covenant adds a bond. Yeah, uh, you can read um, like section 77 of the RLDS Doctrine and Covenants. I, I was curious one day, I'm like, what was the mindset going on? What came after section 76, the infamous eternal life uh, section in the Doctrine and Covenants? And I'm reading and it starts out about the poor. 
you know, we want to take care of the poor, but then we get into these, this order, this order that's being made in the church. It's an order of a group of people within a group of people. And they, they swear allegiance to that order. And, and if they give that up, they'll be turned over to the buffetings of Satan. They'll lose their place and standing in the quote church, which mm -hmm. we're redefining what the church is uh, based on any failure. <laughs> yeah. So we have this, that, that scripture came to me when you were talking about all of the oaths and bonds and how we were told not to do that anymore. Yeah. I was just listening to a podcast, uh, quite interesting one. I hadn't heard of it from before, about a young man who just recently left the church. And he said that during COVID, he was a high counselor in his stake. And uh, he, the rules at this that moment during COVID was you could go to church and enter with a mask on. But once you got in, if you were social distanced, you could take your mask off. Well, so he went in to a high council meeting with the stake president and they sat in the chapel, everybody like six feet apart, as we all pretended to do. And he took his mask off. Well, the stake president got mad at him. And uh, he's like, you you know, put your mask back on. He's like, well, the rules say this. And the stake president pulled the trump card. He's like, do you sustain me or not? And he had and he's the, the direct implication is if you didn't sustain him, you're out of your calling because you have apostatized. And if you do sustain him, you put your mask on. And that's what whether they say it explicitly or it's all implied, that's exactly how the LDS church works. The person above you, you sustain them, which means whatever they say, they tell you to put a mask on your face, they tell you to jump, whatever they say you have to do, because it's part of the sustained culture, the covenant that you make um, in the temple. So, yeah, it's amazing how much power they have over your life once you make those oaths. We, uh, we might roll our eyes on the RLDS side of that, but really, we're all part of that if we go back to 1830. And the precedent was set by Joseph Smith when he gave a revelation speaking as first person from the mouth of God that no one will give, you know, are basically you're not going to argue with the prophet. He's the only one to give commands to the church. So yeah. Oliver Cowdery, you have your part and you can give revelation stuff, but don't act like you're saying something that's affecting the whole church from me because that's only Joseph and don't don't argue with him about that. Yeah. So that spirit at the organizational pivotal moment of the church, that understanding was then that seed was planted in the hearts of the members of the church that God does appoint men that are infallible, that you can't argue with, that you don't question when they give certain orders. Now that seed has sprouted and now you've <laughs> it's only 200 world. years later you're sitting in a in a and it's like well do you sustain me like do you recognize my god-given hierarchy authority over you that i have more understanding from him or that i have more um authority than you do to tell you what to do and and we have to accept that or basically our we go back to 1830 and everything crumbles then you know, that goes right along with that podcast I sent you yesterday that I was listening to that history podcast about why do bad th people or why do good people do bad things? And it talked about um, this group of uh, men during the during the Nazi era. And it talked about a group of people during the Vietnam War and a group of people during the, Amer the American West War with the Indians and how a leader can grab a group of good people, just normal people and say, I want you to go murder a bunch of civilians. And four out of five of them will follow those orders and go over and murder civilians, shoot little babies and stuff because they're being told what to do and they just follow along. And I think what a devilish system to set up where your leader says, look, you've sworn an oath before God that you do what I want. So I need you to go murder these people. And you're like, oh, OK, I guess it's supposed to be real. And I mean, Mount Meadows Massacre is one thing that just pops right in there, of course, with all the rest. Um, you do what you're told, right? Right. And I think realizing that this takes place in our culture without trying to be too condemning of each other, but that we're, we're all part of that mindset. And it takes a lot of work and effort and, and introspection to try to step out from under that web of people above me know better than me. Yeah. Uh, you know, leave it to the experts to tell me what to do. Yeah. I can't know myself. So I'll... I'll submit myself to their authority. And we're still doing this in our traditions, in our church. It's all over. It's in my profession as well. I just was teaching my students in a college level composition class. I was like, you know, you read this text 
and trust yourself, trust your intuition about what you what you get from it. And then my supervisor comes in the class and says, you need to also always trust the experts. You need to look at the ex what they say about what the text means. And it's just so funny how we have this ivory tower, whether it's in government, religion, whether it's in academia, where we, the people on the top, all say, okay, you guys need to trust the people on the top because we know better than you do. It happens everywhere. It's mankind. This is the fallen nature of man. Well, and we... I mean, it's a necessary part of our culture, right? If I have a, a cancerous tumor, I certainly want an expert that knows what he's doing to remove that and not a resident that specializes in something else. You know what I mean? It's like we all have to, uh, I mean, we, we all have actions we do every day based on decisions made by people above us that know more. And that's a part of society. But when it comes to the spiritual eternal but science. even that i mean you could put people above you i mean you could take COVID for example but i will say cancer i have someone who's really near and dear to me who um, got cancer and he was given six months to live and the the doctors wanted to do all these treatments to him and he said no i'm not gonna do any treatments i'm just gonna change my diet and he literally i mean he, he was he was far gone and uh, that was 10 years ago. He's still alive and kicking. Didn't do any of the treatments that all the doctors told him to do. M miracle, chance, whatever you want to call it. But sometimes you can get advice from people who know a lot. But because they know a lot doesn't mean necessarily that they know what's best for you. And uh, I mean, I think that's just every part of society. I think that there's a lot of people who you can look to and listen to but at the end of the day if you give up your free agency to see to somebody else to make a decision for you man what's the purpose of life mm -hmm. yeah i was actually going to use that as an example for the flip side because i i have known of and known those that do reject something that could be life-sustaining yeah and then suffer because of it and it doesn't turn out that way but sometimes it does yeah but Anyway, little little bit of a rabbit hole, but not but not really. So that's embedded in our spiritual DNA at big time in this church is that there are those above us that have certain abilities, whether it's reading section eighty three or of the doctrine and covenants and the priesthood authority and receiving blessings through them. But it's well woven into our spiritual DNA. Um, well, let me bring back up your anything else on that. The covenant path is also different. I know that's a key word in the LDS side. Uh, but again, it's it's above and beyond baptism. That's yeah, kind of path that there's more and more to go on and forward with, right? The way they've just turned this idea of covenant on its head, reversed it from what it means in the Book of Mormon to what it means here is just so sick and wrong. Ah, it just makes me sad. Okay, go ahead. Wow. Something that is never taught in the Book of Mormon. And Renlund finished by teaching that each covenant adds a bond. As he finished teaching that last point. Renlin called up two young women and a young man from the audience. Then, while he watched from the pulpit, he directed his wife to bind their hands. Violet Kimball. The young man was only bound with one loop by his wife, signifying the one covenant of baptism. The first of the young women was bound with two wraps to include the temple endowment. And the poor final young woman had her hands tightly bound by Sister Renland. You could almost see her kind of start in surprise at how tight the bindings were. I was wondering if she was going to have her circulation cut off. That was signifying the additional covenant of the temple marriage. Renland then asked the youth to try to get out of their bonds. The first two were able to, but the poor last girl couldn't budge hers. She was captive. He smiled. This fact was then taught to be a good thing, capital G, capital T, by Elder Renland. And he concluded his object lesson by saying, this demonstration is metaphorically what happens when we make and keep multiple covenants with God. I want to go back to that. So there was uh, three people on the stage, a man uh, and, and then two women. Um, let's see. So you see this, she said the first, the guy here on the right, this man, that one loop was symbolizing his marriage covenant, right? Uh, one loop was baptism. Baptism. Sorry. Okay. Baptism. It. Oh my gosh. So one loop is baptism. It, it's you know baptism is just a weak covenant, is what I'm getting from this. It's easy. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Easy to weasel out of it. And yeah, I would just say, enough. 
yeah, for a time, maybe, maybe you yeah. feel that way, but that is not what the scriptures uh, <laughs> teach. So then this little uh, young lady over here in the middle, uh, what was the two loops there? It was I'm pretty loops. sure she's in the endowment. Okay. And then this third one here added on ceiling, the marriage ceiling in the temple. Okay. So not being from LDS culture, but what I see here is as we add on additional uh, covenants, um, we are being bounded closer to Jesus, I guess, or our relationship with our creator so that it's not as easy to get out of. Whereas if it's just a baptismal covenant, it seems like it doesn't like there's not this force holding us into that relationship. Right. right. Maybe easy to fall apart. Maybe be easy to fail in perhaps. Yeah. Okay. I mean, look at the guy with the baptism thing. I mean, there's nothing holding him. He could just shake his hands and it's off. Like the baptism is nothing basically. And what that's symbolizing to me is we, it shows the culture of baptism, at least in the LDS church, but it's also in the our LDS church. We think that, once we go into the water and are baptized, that's the covenant. And I would admit, maybe that is easy to feel like you can weasel out of. But if you read the Book of Mormon, it says those accepted into baptism had already brought forth, forth fruits of repentance mm -hmm. and um, and a broken heart and contrite spirit. And the baptism is a reflection of that. But that's not what's saving them or holding them together in, and that you trust in. I'm trusting in the fact that Jesus says, Broken heart, contrite spirit allows my atoning blood to be placed on you and save you. And if you don't have that, then my blood cannot save you. Yeah. And so I can go into the water all day long and make a baptismal commitment. But it's about where my heart's at. So that's kind of a misnomer, I think, or a, a gross misrepresentation of the baptismal covenant right, right there in the... Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. All right. So... Uh, I just wanted to bring those three. I want to make sure we, because I, I didn't really catch that the first time through, but I'm looking at it from not non RLDS or non LDS. And maybe it's part of our LDS culture is because we get baptized when we're eight. None of us have a clue what we're doing. We just kind of get shepherded into the chapel and into the water. That because we didn't do it purposefully, maybe that's how most people feel. Maybe it's um, a Freudian slip. Like this is how we actually feel about baptism. It doesn't really mean anything. Right. We did it before we even knew we were doing it and we can't remember it. Yeah. Maybe a good point just to interject here is that the Book of Mormon says nothing about being baptized when you're eight years old. Um, as a matter of fact, it says that children are protected and covered by the atonement of Jesus. Right. Uh, by not knowing, you know, having the law and knowing how to implement and interact with that in our life in their lives. So, you know, maybe some children at eight completely ready but I, I just have a hard time thinking of that and i i believe that does add to our downfall a little bit on how we view baptism yeah all right um i want to zoom, go forward a little bit here right there so this is a picture of what is this matt <laughs> <laughs> oh this was uh so several years ago the church um uh dedicated the I think it's the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania temple, one of the Pennsylvania temples. And as the, they always have this big youth festival thing they put on before they do temples, wherever they go. And this, they had all these youth put on this pageant. And this was the climax of the pageant where they all had to turn and kind of worship the temple. And uh, yeah, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, this is what the LDS church does. Mm. More to say on temples later. All right. Church and its leaders worship. Their God seems so bizarre. And so when I have important questions, as always, I turn to the Book of Mormon. What I find in its pages helps me to know that while the LDS Church teaches that God equals bondage, the Book of Mormon teaches that Christ equals freedom. The Book of Mormon teaches this by showing two contrasting examples. First, it gives the example of a great and abominable church that leads its members into bondage. As the Lord showed Nephi in a vision, and it came to pass that I saw among the Gentiles the formation of a great church. 
And the angel said unto me, Behold the formation of a church, which is most abominable of, above all other churches, which slayeth the saints of God, yea, and tortureth them, and bindeth them down, and yoketh them with a yoke of iron, and bringeth them down into captivity. And it came to pass that I beheld this great and abominable church, and I saw the devil, that he was the founder of it. I believe that we are the Gentiles of the last days. What church or churches today teach us to be brought into bondage? Which church is teaching a yoke of iron the covenants we have to make? Which church, both publicly and privately, brings us down into captivity? It scares me to see it on such open and proud display. Can Elder Renlin and his fellow leaders not see that they are fulfilling prophecy for all to see? Later in 2 Nephi, Nephi teaches that it is actually the devil who is the founder of churches who practice bondage. Nephi shows that the devil's desire is to, quote, lead them by the neck with a flaxen cord until he bindeth them with his strong cords forever. In direct contrast to the teachings of Apostle Renland and the LDS Church, the Book of Mormon teaches us not to let ourselves be brought into bondage. In addition to Christ's own teachings directly against swearing any oaths or covenants, Lehi's words to Hill's children also resonate strongly today. He said, Oh, that you would awake, awake from a deep sleep, yea, even from the sleep of hell, and shake off the awful chains by which you are bound, which are the chains which bind the children of men. And they are carried away captive down to the eternal gulf of misery and woe. Pause just week and arise from the dust. How can we and Lehi's descendants awake and escape these chains and bindings? Lehi told his son Joseph that the Lord had promised that through a choice seer, quote, the Messiah should be made manifest unto them in the latter days, in the spirit of power, unto the bringing them out of the darkness unto light, yea, out of hidden darkness and out right, of like, we want you to stop it. freedom. Yeah. Okay, this is such a great contrast. For those who believe that what the LDS Church is doing is true, you just can't find scriptures in the Book of Mormon to support it. You cannot. And yet you can find a, a whole bunch of scriptures that will show that captivity, bondage, oppression, all chains, um, cords are all from the devil. I mean, there's no way to get around it. It just says it, it over and over again. It's from the devil. It's from Satan. It's from the great vulnerable church. And to be able to come out and say, oh, see, it's good to be bound. It's good to be captive. It's good to have things tied, to be tied up. It, th there's no scriptural basis for it. And maybe this goes back to the whole reason why they trot Elder Haney out there to say, you know, the words of these dead prophets in the Book of Mormon, they don't age well. They're not. Don't listen to them because they're trying to rewrite their own new scriptures where they do the opposite of the Book of Mormon and they call it good and call the Book of Mormon evil. Um, but if if you're trying to be an apologist for this, you've got nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. You, you have nothing to, to say to support what Renlund's doing. It's just sick and wrong. I know analogies break down at certain areas, but this to me is showing um, that the more the more covenants and oaths that you make with the lord and enter into that it's harder to break free in, mm -hmm. in other words it's like presenting it as a safety yeah. whereas we all have choice and freedom and, uh, this analogy shows me that you know you're the more covenants you make you're you're giving up that freedom the ability to leave and you're being held closer and closer together to something um and so it's seemingly good but the flip side is is just appalling really yeah to use and i know you're making an analogy but to use women and having their arms bound together is just another shade of creepiness in my yeah. i mean i know there's a man up there too but even a man i mean having them having your arms tied together where you're yeah. losing the ability to was a little odd so much of this just comes back to who we believe god is and what we think his nature is who is jesus really and if you picture him as the temple does um, and and the covenants or the the blessings that are given to us in the temple will be kings and rulers and magistrates and um, priests. If you picture God as that kind of person who values being a ruler, ha having power, then 
like the medieval kings, they have people swear oaths of fealty and they're bound and they have to kneel down in subjection. Um, then this is all completely natural. You, you, if you believe God is like a medieval king, then this would fit in exactly with who, how heaven would be. But as you read the Book of Mormon closely and you see that Christ is somebody much different, he is the humblest, he is patient, long suffering, he is gentle, he's meek, he's kind, he appears to Moroni and talks to him a man to man, not as a god to a servant, um, as in the most humblest way. If you can see Christ as he really is, then you can see what his kingdom, quote unquote, really is, where it's people who are free and equal instead of being subjected and bound down. And um, the Book of Mormon makes this these so clear. I just read a scripture two days ago that talks about this as well. I just don't have it right on my, top of my head. But you get the kingdom you're looking for. If you're looking for a kingdom that subjects and binds people, you're going to get that kingdom after this life if that's what you want. But you'll be surprised that it's actually the devil who's the who's going to be the king of that kingdom. If you're looking for a kingdom that frees people, then you're going to be surprised at the king of heaven that he's not somebody who's sitting on this throne and ruling with an iron fist, but he's somebody who's out among the people, loving people. Um, yeah, I think it just goes back to what are the desires of our hearts, and that's what we'll get on the other side. I love the imagery when it says, when we die, we go and we see God, and the wicked will see God in his face and then remain in their sins. They're like, I don't want this. I don't want some weak God. I want to be a ruler. I want to be a, you know, a king. I want to have power over people. I want to bind people. Well, if that's your desire, you're not going to be part of king, the kingdom of heaven. You're going to be a part of the kingdom where that's what they do. They want to oppress. They want to have rulers. They want to be bound. Um, and the Book of Mormon over and over shows which kingdom that is. There's so many applications of this in our life. Uh, just this morning, I saw a comment on one of the videos, and it was very respectful. And the man said, I don't think you, you understand the nature of God. I thought, oh, man, here comes a rant. But then he said, but... I really enjoy your videos, and I trust that we'll all be brought together to the same understanding. And I thought, I can live with that all day long because I don't see any form of bondage there. Like, he's not trying to bind me to his way of thinking. And really, that a lot of those disagreements, you're really trying to put someone into bondage to come to your way of thinking yep. instead of allowing them to be free and trust their own heart and their own walk with the Lord. I just see that now as that's, that's that oppression when we try to manipulate people with our words. And I'd rather have comments like that all day. I said, man, it feels like we're on the same team, maybe seeing things differently, but trusting that God will bring us to the same understanding. That's freedom to me. That's, that's freedom to, right. To shine and to go forth and not be bound down by listening to someone else trying to force their thoughts on you. Just that attitude of openness is a really good sign. That means that someone who values the opposite of oppression. Even if we don't understand now, if we're open, that's the important thing. I was going to ask you, do you think being belonging to a, a religion that has so many um, stipulations, so many criteria for salvation, that when we step back and talk about freedom, that it's uh, scary to people? Maybe it feels a little loosey-goosey or, well, there's, so there's no truth now? You know, I got to go find truth for myself rather than relying on what I've been told uh, and how to operate in life all this time. And it starts to feel uh, awkward, maybe, or fearful, scary. I don't know. Yeah. So if the more strict your religion is and the more binding, the more uncertain there is after you leave it, definitely. And I think that's why so many LDS people when they break from the church or start to have doubts, go through that dark night of the soul because it is so scary. Um, you're being you're used to being told in every little thing what to do, and suddenly you realize there's nobody above me telling me what to do. Oh no, now what? And yeah, it's scary for sure. There, uh, I think it's more subtle probably on the RLDS side, but uh, and maybe that makes it a little more a little more dangerous. <laughs> Let's, let's continue on. I believe that the Book of Mormon we have now, this lesser part, 
is the first installment in the Lord's promise that he would deliver us from darkness and captivity. More is coming. I don't want to get hung up on that right here. But for now, we have this Book of Mormon that has the power to deliver us from the bonds that the LDS Church seems to put on our hands and on our lives. Over the last year, the Book of Mormon has literally delivered me from both physical and spiritual bondage. It amazes me when I think about it. For example, I no longer have my wages garnished each month by wealthy men in fancy suits. I no longer have my diet restricted or my clothes chosen for me by these men. I no longer have to swear oaths to blindly obey them. Now my mind and spirit are free to ask questions and read and listen for answers from God, not from men. Answers that open and expand my mind instead of confusing and restricting it. What wonderful liberty. But this liberty has come with some challenges. Having been a very scrupulous and obedient Mormon all my life, I found, often found myself feeling like there's something missing, like I'm forgetting something, or I should be doing something, or I should be looking for someone to tell me what to do all the time. I think this is what you were talking I'm, about. I have to pinch yeah. myself and remember yeah. this piece. That's exactly, that's exactly it. And I, I think that's a reality for us. Yeah. Um, I've, you know, I've gone through this process, am going through this process. Of You said a couple of weeks ago, we spent so much time discussing what's not in the Book of Mormon instead of focusing on what's in the Book of Mormon over and over and over. Yeah. And um, I think that process is giving up those things we focus on that aren't in the Book of Mormon. But then the freedom comes from focusing on what is in the Book of Mormon over and over and over. And all of a sudden, it doesn't seem like this big, open, scary landscape that I've like, well, okay, so who has power to baptize? Or should I have sacrament with this person? Or, you know, all of these things that we can focus on, you start to see this freedom of Book of Mormon really does have some specific things that I can implement in my life. And let's see what the fruit of that is. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that too. And, it, and having the Book of Mormon um, kind of helps me to have <clears throat> kind of guidelines in my mind because it's a temptation to go off and say, well, now I'm going to read the Apocrypha from the Bible or I've, there's this other person who cropped up in South America who's got these golden plates or, you know, and it's a temptation to run after every new little thing. Um, and then you just don't even know what to believe. But realizing the Book of Mormon came from an angel, was witnessed by 12 people. And it has really has some good definitions and, and defining lines in there. It just gives a lot of guidance, but also freedom in the simplicity. And so I don't have to worry about, maybe I'm missing something from, you know, maybe the ancient Buddhist principles have something I'm missing. I don't have to worry about that right now. And I've seen that, Matt. I've seen that more than a handful of times of yes. just interacting with people that have left. So do you think subconsciously many people leave what they perceive to be bondage, which, which is, but then don't know it, but they're looking for something else to then wrap around their arms to feel safe again, maybe? Exactly. That is so true. It's like someone who leaves one abusive relationship and gets sucked right into the next one because they're so used to it. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that hits home, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I do a lot of that in healthcare or have with domestic violence and repeat abusers and, yeah. you know, are you feeling safe? And, and unfortunately, it is that pattern that has to be broken. But I think I see this in the spiritual realm. Oh, yeah. Look at the Nephites and the Jaredites. Both of them, they get, they go through the wilderness they cross the ocean. They get to this free land. It's wide open. It's rich. And both groups of people, Nephi asks you, what do you guys want? We want a king. Oh, man, I don't want you to have a king. Jared, I, brother of Jared, what do you guys want from us before we die? We want a king. Dang it. We just came from that. What do you guys want another king for? It's like we don't understand that once we have freedom, that is the blessing. And then we always just want to go back. We're like, well, we came from a place that had a king. And we don't remember that coming away from that was the good thing. That was the liberating thing. And we, we just go off and look for the next new king. 
Mm. Uh, back to the video. This freedom is the promised land. This is what the Book of Mormon talks and teaches about. I'm finally free to do whatever inspires me, as long as I'm not hurting God or others. The world is my oyster, and I can make of my life whatever I want to. This promised land Christ gives me reminds me of the Jaredites. They traveled for years. They struggled through wildernesses. They crossed the great deep, and then finally, as it says in Ether 6, they did land upon the shore of the promised land. And when they had set their feet upon the shores of the promised land, they bowed themselves down upon the face of the land and did humble themselves before the Lord and did shed tears of joy before the Lord because of the multitude of his tender mercies over them. And it came to pass that they went forth upon the face of the land and began to till the earth. That's it. I love that. They gave thanks, then they got up and they began to till the earth. Nothing about building temples or having callings or creating hierarchies or swear, swearing binding covenants. They were finally and simply free. As I work in my garden, I remember the Jaredites. Simple, pure life tilling the earth. As I pray and sing songs of praise to Jesus, I remember the Jaredites. Simple, pure religion without leaders trying to bind them down or tie them up. There's always a danger for getting this deliverance, of taking it for granted and reverting back to iniquity. And the Book of Mormon teaches how to avoid that too. As the angel told Alma the younger, remember the captivity of thy fathers in the land of Helam and in the land of Nephi, and remember how great things he has done for them, for they were in bondage and he has delivered them. The key was to remember, to remember the captivity and remember how good it is to be free. The Book of Mormon shows us that the Alma the Younger did remember. Like this comes up. Later, he told the sons of Mosiah. Yeah. Of all the times they talk about remembering the Moses bringing the children of Israel out of bondage and captivity. Mm -hmm. It's a theme that comes up throughout the whole Book of Mormon. They're always remembering, remembering, remembering. And I don't know why I've never glommed onto that before. But I just kind of like, yeah, that is a theme of the Book of Mormon. Remembering the captivity so we don't go back to it again. Something I've never taught. No one ever teaches that because what are you supposed to remember being captive by? Oh, dang, that's right. It's our church. But once you're out, you realize that's what the Book of Mormon was trying to say all that time. Holy cow. No kidding. Uh, <laughs> many times, remember, remember. Mm -hmm. uh, it, because we are so quick to remember, we fall continually into the vain traditions of our fathers. Yeah. Remember what it did to them. And yet we we have all the hope in the world. Not this time. We're we're not like them. We are just not like them. We are a new, different, better breed of member of the church with new enlightenment and understanding. <laughs> right. And we're just the Zoramites once again, thinking yeah. that we have arrived and we have it. Yeah. And, uh, very good. Yep. I also say, okay, so you I saw a picture yesterday planting potatoes with your hands in the dirt, right? Yep. <laughs> I often see, I, I have this question asked, okay, so you have this new understanding, now what? <laughs> and I think, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that little simplistic thing you just shared with the Jaredites. They were free and they tilled the earth. That's, to me, that's a symbol of remembering your freedom. Now go live your life and interact with people like I would. I mean, what, how how much more complicated is the gospel than that? Exactly. Get about living. People say, now what? Go live. Yeah. Go live with new eyes. Look at the world differently. Look at the people around you as the thumbprint of Jesus that have been ugly stained by the sins of this world, but are these beautiful imprint, uh, images of our Heavenly Father, that if he's allowed to come back to them and enter into their life, you're now surrounded with beautiful images of Jesus. They just need the light of Jesus. But this is the handiwork of our Father. Go live life. Go live with different eyes, with the freedom to view people with love and acceptance and knowing that they are the creatures of our God in heaven and that they're not outsiders that haven't made, you know, 14 million covenants with each other as we come closer together to this small little group of people that are so 
closely held together by our traditions that we look down at the rest of the world. Oh, Mike, you didn't frame that. That is the it in a nutshell. It's already forgotten. <laughs> no. You're just free to go out there and love people who yeah. before we would have judged. Yeah. It's, it's like this uh, symbolism. What do I do now? Go get your fingers dirty. Yeah. Go, go till the earth. Go live life and ask God to help you see the people around you as his creation and treat them as such. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Beautiful stuff here, man. I don't want to. <laughs> over. This is wonderful. Who were his friends? Yea, I have always remembered the captivity of my fathers and that same God who delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians to deliver them out of bondage. Like Alma, I will try to remember the captivity the Lord has brought me out of. And by remembering, hopefully I won't fall into a similar trap of bondage again with anybody else. Alma's father, Alma, who escaped oh. <laughs> with his people from the captivity of King Noah, also taught the importance of remembering. He said in Mosiah 23, And now I say unto you, ye have been oppressed by King Noah, and have been in bondage to him and his priests. Well, that sounds familiar. And have been brought down into iniquity by them. Therefore ye were bound by the bands of iniquity. And now as ye have been delivered by the power of God out of these bounds, yea, even out of the hands of King Noah and his people, and also from the bonds of iniquity, even so I desire that ye should stand fast in this liberty wherewith ye have been made free, and that ye trust no man to be a king over you, and also trust no one to be your teacher nor your minister, except he be a man of God, walking in his ways and keeping his commandments." Man, <laughs> the Book of Mormon is so poignant. It's beautiful. As soon as it says, trust no one to be your teacher or your minister, and you flash to the scriptures in the Book of Mormon, and they ordained elders, priests, and teachers. Well, it says, don't let anyone be my teacher, but they were ordaining teachers. And so you have to read the rest of the sentence, except he be a man of God, walking in his ways and keeping his commandments. Yep. Yeah. Have we just lowered the bar so much that we um, we just throw in people to be those teachers and rulers over us? Um, I don't know. If we do it. Certainly, we're not doing it consciously. It's just what we've been taught to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because we always have a king. And like the brother Jared told his people, you guys want a king, but surely this thing leadeth to captivity. Surely. It leaded to captivity. And what the LDS church did from the very get-go was they established a king, a, someone who ruled over the, everybody, over the whole church with a, their word was law. And it's, and it's continued to this day. And when they teach what? something that is the opposite of what the Book of Mormon really teaches, then they're not going to be a man of God. They're not walking in his ways. So they're not keeping his commandments. And so, yeah, they have teachers and ministers. But when they teach the opposite of what the Book of Mormon teaches, then you can't say that they're men of God. Even if they dress up in a nice suit and say Jesus every other word, it doesn't mean that what they're teaching is right. And uh, so, yeah, my ministers and my teachers are the, these men from the Book of Mormon who had the power of God. Alma, it says when he went down there in the water to baptize, the spirit of the God came down upon him. And um, everybody could see it. They all knew it. Abinadi, when he was testifying in front of the priests of King Noah, the Spirit of God came upon him. He turned white in front of all the people. They all knew it. Uh, you could say this. I mean, an, any number of these men in the Book of Mormon, everybody knew when they were a man of God because they were sanctified in their presence. They all could see it. And I have yet to see somebody like that in on the earth today. And so I don't trust any of them. I don't mind listening to people and having what they say. I think it's wonderful because I don't know any more than anybody else does. But to put them above me, that's a whole other issue. I I like how you just phrased all of that. Um, I don't know that I trust anyone on the earth right now that I know of to be yeah. in this category. Other, And I like how you said, other than the ministers of the Book of Mormon, uh, we see that. I know in our history, we have testimonies of things that may fall into this category you know we have men that are purporting to see 
you know, all kinds of prophets from the Old Testament, Joseph and the temple uh, reported to see all kinds of things. But then I look at the fruit and I think, well, the fruit was certainly different uh, going forward from those experiences than what I read in the word. Yeah. But yeah. we do, we do take on titles and we allow them to be our teachers and ministers. I, I have no problem with people coming to church and listening to the whoever's quote preaching that day. Mm -hmm. If we all had the mindset, this is man's best idea. And when I hear truth, the spirit within me will recognize that. Matt, when you, you know, as you're sharing this video, you know, I know you don't want anyone to look to you as a teacher or leader. But some of these things in here, as you're presenting the Book of Mormon, you're just organizing thoughts and putting them together. Like, this is what these people said, and this is what we're living. Where's the contrast? Where's the conflict? You know, where does this fall apart? Yeah. Just it's reminding right. us what's in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Right. And so I feel this enlightenment inside, and I, I feel like this is truth, and it's in alignment with everything that I've known and read. This is edifying to me. Now, if your next slide or, you're, you know, at the end of the video, you talk about, so so come and do this ordinance and follow this, and it's not in the Book of Mormon, then that's not edifying. Right. Exactly. But we can, so there is, I guess what I'm saying is there is benefit in listening to one another, but not holding each other up. And that's the hard, the hard thing. I, I We get from time to time comments, they're like, I had a lady ask me, they're like, is this a lecture or is this just a, a commentary? And I realized that in that question, she's asking, are you trying to speak with authority or are you just sharing your thoughts? It's a great question. And, that, and that's a byproduct of the culture of all of us. Yes. And so I say we're friends having casual conversation about the things of eternity. Certainly the things we talk about, Matt, you wouldn't put a video out here if you didn't believe this with all of your heart right now. You wouldn't be spending time on it. Right. So this is how we see things. This is how we believe the scriptures, what the scriptures are saying. And until, uh, you know, until more truth comes or I realize I'm wrong, I go with that. But I, at the same time, I say, trust the process. The Holy Spirit will guide people listening and yeah. things that maybe are off. Maybe they have more understanding. on. But don't, you know, don't set people up. I can't say it any more than Messiah right here. Don't trust any man to be your teacher, except to be a man of God, walking in his ways and keeping his commandments. Yeah. Love it. It's great. All right. Anything else in this? Oh, this, we're almost done. We'll finish it out here. Get another Good. One. All right. I'm going to leave this picture. <laughs> Sorry about playing that without the. That's fine. And so now I till the earth. I pray and sing. And I read the Book of Mormon each day, trusting those ancient men of God to be my teachers. I trust no man to be a king over me now, and no one to be my minister. I listen to many people, and I try to love and respect all people. But I want to do as Alma counseled, and stand fast in this liberty wherewith Christ has made me free. I wish that for my family, for my loved ones, and for all people everywhere. I wish for freedom. To end with the words of Jacob, written in 2 Nephi 9, O my beloved brethren, turn away from your sins. Shake off the chains of him that would bind you fast. Come unto that God who is the rock of your salvation. Come unto Christ. I'm sorry, Matt. This is a great line, but I have to I have to just show the what's the contrast that the Book of Mormon is saying here. It's telling us to shake off our chains. Mm -hmm. And the example given by that video at the beginning was make sure oh. your chain strong enough that you can't break it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Perfect contrast. Ah, oh, the Book of Mormon just sets us free if we listen to it. <laughs> it counters every one of these false doctrines so clearly. Well, okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. What does what does freedom mean for you right now at this point in your life? Because I was watching you wind up this video, and I just, without lifting you up, this to me is so life-giving it's a miracle to me and it shouldn't be but it's a miracle to me because i see in your pathway you've left all of that bondage and found freedom in the book of mormon and i just believe this is available to every follower of jesus christ oh, yeah that was grown up in the restoration heritage and those that have yet to hear anything about it so what does freedom look like for you today matt 
I would say the greatest freedom I have right now is a picture in my mind of who Jesus really is. And I know I talked about this before. It's just being able to love him as somebody who loves me and is not an authoritative ruler, but someone who is humble and meek and who just wants the best for me and my loved ones and just wants me to want the best for everybody in the world too. And the freedom to just look at anybody in the street, you know, they're drinking their coffee or their beer or they've got tattoos or they look haggard or they're dirty or whatever and just think man these people are just they're wonderful they're just as good as i want to be and god loves each one of them and i can love them too it is so wonderful i just to be able to be free to feel like god loves me to feel like he's a loving person and that i can love other people too it's so nice you go ahead I I wanted to, I'll share something that happened this week. I, I arrived at a, a weekly meeting that we have every other Tuesday in my job. And there was another lady that arrived early and we were there like half hour early. So anyway, we're talking about migraines. I don't know why, but I'm like, I'm going to share a story with her about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so I know we're Facebook friends, but we don't interact. We hardly ever talk one on one, but I know just from her Facebook post that she was a Christian. She wouldn't be offended, but I had known anything else about her belief. Anyway, I was like, told her the story. My wife and I were out West a couple of years ago in the middle of nowhere in this little hotel. I wake up in the middle of the night and my wife's in the corner of the hotel room, just crying, going through all of our little toiletry bags and everything, just looking for some medicine of some sort. I ask her what's wrong. She goes, oh, my head hurts so bad. I can still hear her voice. My wife's tough, 10 times tougher than me. I don't know that I've ever seen her cry from a headache. She was crying. Yeah. She has migraines. She suffers from them, and she's usually down for a few days. I thought, oh, my gosh. We have no elders. There's no priesthood, no one to administer to her. And so I asked her to come back to bed. I woke up my son, who was probably, I don't know, 15, 16 at the time. I said, come over here and get in bed. And so he came over there. I said, I want you to just, just grab mom's leg, just kind of rub her feet. And I was rubbing her head. And, and I didn't try to do anything that I thought was taught was outside of my, quote, priesthood scope. But I just asked him to pray for her. And so we both said prayers for her. And he crawled over and went back to bed. And I sat there for a few minutes to look more. And then I said, hon, I'm so sorry. You're struggling with this pain. She goes, it's okay. It's almost all gone now. Wow. Now, Having lived with her for 15 years or being married, I know when she gets headaches, they don't go away in two minutes. That's impossible. It's never happened. So I was sharing this story. I said, I said, we pray for her and Jesus healed us, healed her and blessed our whole family on vacation. She was able to enjoy the next day. And so this lady's like, oh, my gosh, she goes, this happened to me when I was on a mission trip in Africa. I had no idea. She suffers from migraines and she was so sick over there and she's like they came together and we they had prayers for me she goes i felt it lift out of my head the pain went away and i was healed immediately yeah. and we're sharing this story but it was different for me because i had this uh i was able to enjoy the moment and i saw her as, as jesus sees her as just a child of god a creature that he loves he created and there was there was no butt sandwich at the end like and I say, but but you're not a member of the church. So how did this happen? Yeah, and I know we, I don't know. Maybe we kid ourselves. I just think that those thoughts are embedded deeper in us than we think, and to have those thoughts slowly be removed, where I yeah. honestly can look at people and I want to hear their story because it has spiritual value to me, and it's just as uh, I hate to use this word, but it's just as authoritative. To the love of Jesus coming from her as a high priest in the church I belong to. Yeah. yeah. It carries the same weight. It's, it's the testimony of the love of our Savior for us. She has just as much access as we do. And to me, that's freedom that I can start looking at other people and seeing their value. Because yeah. don't we devalue people that aren't a member of our church we, subconsciously? Perhaps? 100% we do. And we don't want to admit that, but. Yeah. I'm happy to admit that and show my folly and say that's not right, but also 
speak of the freedom that I found in him and, and loving people. And I got a long way to go, but I just small testimony of, I think where the freedom takes us and how can we, how can we have compassion for the world when we look at them as lesser beings? Yes. Us. Yeah. How do we have true compassion? And then think, how did Jesus have compassion for us? Did he look at us the whole time as these poor, pathetic souls that have no idea about truth? Or did he just love on us and want us to, to catch the vision of him? Yeah. Yeah. That is, oh, it's, it's peeling back layers, though. It's peeling back layers of years of a lifetime of putting on this hard shell of us versus them to now be trying to break that you know, and be having a contrite heart or a contrite spirit and a broken heart to be open to other people who I might think are dirty or or impure or unclean and just loving everybody and realizing that it it was my pride that was the true dirt and the true uncleanness. Um, and to see how, you know, when God, when Jesus had a chance to to interact with people, he almost always went to the sinners and the publicans. Um, he wasn't interested in the nicely washed rich people. He was out there among the poor. And, and the chances I've had this last year to try to go out of my comfort zone and try to interact on a one-to-one -one level, like on the same level of people who before I would have thought, oh, they're beneath me, has been magical. It's been magical. And to realize that I was the one that was beneath them all this time, and I just didn't realize it. Right. Yeah, you said something. Jesus did spend a lot of ministry on the poor and the downtrodden. And I think at times that leads us to romanticize the homeless and the poor, you know, thinking they are so loved by the state. They're not any more loved than the rich people. I just think that the poor are more receptive. Uh, you know, we have the uh, Book of Mormon story of, uh, was it? Oh, gosh. I want to say the right king. King Limhi? That, yeah. Or Noah, Limhi, that said, I would give up all of my sins to oh, Noah. Oh, no, Lamoni. Lamoni, thank you. <laughs> oh, the guys are going to get me. Yeah. I, I missed, I switched up some kings in the Book of Mormon at one time, and it's been a long standing joke. Okay, so <laughs> Lamoni, I'll give up all of my sins. So there's a person that had everything in the world, but their heart was right, and they would give up everything. Yep. But that seems to be the exception, not the rule. And his father said the same thing, and then his father did give up the kingdom. That's so cool. It was yeah. like just a year or two later, he gave up everything to be part of that church or to be part of the fold of God, basically. Man. Well, thanks for this video. You know, I had to watch it a couple of times to get to the meat of it because I haven't been brought up in that tradition. But I think I, see, I definitely see the contrast you're making between freedom and bondage and those things that we think give us freedom or feel like they're helping us are really keeping us in bondage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, anything else to add? Thanks for letting us talk about this a little bit. No, this has been a lot of fun. I enjoyed our talk and man, just the feelings I get when, when we're together talking about these important things. It's, it's great. Um, and I'll look forward to the next one. I feel like I've learned something this morning, or at least I've, remembered some things I already knew but forgot. And I yep. think that's, the, that's why we should all be in the scriptures all the time. The Word of God and the Book of Mormon. There's so many good things there and the world wants you to forget. Satan's like, forget that. Forget that. You don't want that. You know, yep. look at what I've put in front of you. And God's yep. like, remember, man, you're falling down the same ditch everybody else has done since I created the world. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Turn around. <laughs> yeah, this is what church truly is supposed to be. We get together oft and we stir each other up in remembrance of, of what we're supposed to know. Yeah. yeah. Speak of the welfare of our souls and then go yeah. get our fingers dirty planting potatoes. And yeah, that's where we're going today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, Matt, I know we'll be back tomorrow morning for another episode, but thank you for sharing your video and for doing what you do. Very good. Helping All right. People. All right, man. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Mike. Take care. All right.